Church, would you stand and worship with us this morning?
that we have the opportunity to just worship you, God, to worship you as a tiny baby, to the man on the cross, Father God, for the blood that you shed for us, Jesus, we are just so thankful. God, let us just be present with you today. Let us be able to just hear your word, to hear your truth, and to allow you to just flow amongst all of us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to A2. My name is Mary Elizabeth. I'm so excited to see all of you today. This is my favorite time. It's connect time. So walk around. Good morning, A2 Church. Oh, let's try that again. Good morning, A2 Church. I love seeing you this morning, and I love, I love this Sunday each year at Christmas. And I want to introduce you to some beautiful families, and I'm going to ask you to step forward a little bit, Kindle, and move on out to the left a bit. I mean, let's keep a straight line because if you curve in, your families don't get to see you, and. Uh, this is really important to your families and your friends. Let me introduce you to some beautiful families, and we'll clap at the end. This is Michael Bowling. This is his wife, Kendall. And this is their beautiful little boy, Tucker Owen Bowling. This guy is pretty new. Born when? Uh, October 24th. October 24th. This is J Jamie and Kira Rankins. And today, we're dedicating Audrey. Marie, Audrey, Audrey, I mispronounced it, Audrey Marie Rankins, and introduce me to your other children, Kira, Adrian James, Adrian James, that's your nephew, Cameron, we're honored to see you, Cameron, this is Dan and Tori Chapel, and this is their little girl, Yates Julia, and she's looking at the pastor like, who is that dude, watch it, oh wow, and uh, wow, this is Stephanie Walters, her husband, Kendall, on the end. And this is Beckett Agro Walters. And these are Kendall and Stephanie's two children. This is KC, and this is Marissa. All right. Give these families a big hand. Hey, families, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to step off the stage and just exhort you for just a moment uh, but I want your families to be able to see you because all of these people brought friends. They have family here and families were honored that you're here. And we do this publicly because these families are admitting in public they need you. They need your support. They need your help. And they're also saying that on a wider scale. They're, they're looking at their church family and they're saying, we need you. We need you to help us. Be the parents God made us to be and raise the children God has called us to be. So families, baby dedication involves four elements. And I'm going to give those to you rather quickly, but hopefully purposefully. Number one, it's a confirmation of your love for God. This is radical. Through the act of baby dedication, you're actually saying, I love God more than I love my baby. Now that is radical. But it's rooted in this idea that only by loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength can we really love our children and those closest to us. Second, 
Baby dedication is a declaration of ownership. You're actually saying this morning by standing before this community, we recognize that this baby doesn't belong to us. This baby belongs to God. Third, baby dedication is a symbol of your commitment to raise your child God's way. Dads, I'd like to exhort each of you for just a moment. One of the most challenging passages in the New Testament to me is Ephesians 6, 4, particularly in the message, which reads like this. Fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them, but instead gently take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Now that's a model for what fatherhood and parenting is all about. And I just want to encourage you Be a godly parent. Teach your child to love and know Jesus. Help them fall in love with Jesus' church. Pray for your children. Disciple your children. Love your spouse like Jesus loves the church. Pursue a life of holiness. This is what it means to really walk out your commitment to Christ. And fourth, baby dedication is claiming God's plan and promise for your child. Proverbs 22 22 verse 6 Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from these things. If you agree to raise your children in this way, I'd like you to respond, all of you parents, by saying, we will. You can say it out loud. Congregation, families, would you join me in praying for these beautiful families? I'd like for you to point your hands in this direction and I'm going to walk along and in your stead anoint every family and their child put your hands in this direction Father thank you for Beckett Agro we dedicate him to you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and in so doing we dedicate Kendall and Stephanie Father Thank you for Yates, Julia. We dedicate her to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in so doing, we dedicate Tori and Dan. Father, thank you for Audrey Marie Rankins. We dedicate her to you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And in so doing, we dedicate Jamie and Kira to you as well. And Father, thank you for Tucker Owen Bowling. We dedicate him to you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so doing, we dedicate Michael and Kendall to you as well. Now, pointing your hands in this direction, repeat this after me. Would you please say, we the body of Christ at A2 Church do dedicate these children to the Lord In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may they know God with their whole heart, follow Jesus their entire life, and make a difference in this world. Amen. Amen. Now, before these families leave the stage, families, we have a dedication certificate for each one of your children and My favorite children's Bible is the Jesus Storybook Bible. I read it and read it and read it. It is beautiful. We've got you one of those. If you've already got it, use this one as a keepsake. But we love you, and we're here to support you. God bless you. Give these families one more time a big hand, and you guys can go off the stage. Come on, let's raise it up. That's so exciting. fat, right? We can pause that for just a second, then we'll go right into that. Right before we look at video announcements, let me just give you this little heads up. Today, between this experience and next experience, and next week, we actually have another. We are dedicating 11 children to Jesus. That's the most we've ever dedicated in one season. Um... Evidently, you guys really believe in church growth, and you are doing your part to help this church. So keep doing that. Hey, now now let's bring up those video announcements. God bless. 
Good morning. We are so glad that you have joined us today. I'd like to give a special welcome to our first, second, and third time guests. And if you're joining us online with A2TV. My name is Amy and we are so excited to continue our series, Advent. But before we do that, here are a few things happening at A2 Church. Tired of doing life alone? Get in a life group. Need someone other than your significant other to talk to? Get in a life group. Want to be in a circle of friends hanging out, having a meal, praying together, celebrating victories, consoling each other in disappointments, developing true, long-lasting relationships? You know it. Life groups, life groups, life groups. Our life group semester kicks off on January 28th. How many times have you been on the outside looking in? Plan on being a part of it. Make plans to join us for our favorite worship experience of the year, Christmas Eve Candlelight Communion at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Christmas Eve includes an illustrated message, your favorite Christmas carols, Holy Communion, and the lighting of the candles. Child care is provided for nursery through preschool only. Older children will join us for the festivities. We're looking forward to spending this special time of year with you. This year, we're going to be celebrating Christmas in A2 Kids by taking a little field trip through time back to a manger in a little town called Bethlehem to see where Jesus was actually born. Okay, we're not actually going to do all that, but we are going to have a live manger scene set up here on campus at A2. That's right, real live animals are going to be here. We're going to have a real live teaching at the manger scene featuring some of the animals that might have been present when Jesus was born. We are so excited for December 17th for our A2 Kids Christmas party, which is going to feature a live manger scene. Bring a friend, see you there. Be sure to join us on December 17th for our annual Christmas celebration. We're going to have a photo booth, hot cocoa, Christmas cookies, and we're going to be celebrating with our No Limits families. Oh, and one more thing, it's Ugly Christmas Sweater Sunday, so be sure to wear your sweaters and join in on the fun. You're going to wear that? Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that God is able to minister to you through this worship experience. <laughs> That's awesome. Good morning, A2. Good morning. How are you this morning? Did everybody have a good snow day? Yeah, wasn't that beautiful? Well, we are so glad that you're here. My name is Shannon Johnson, and I'm just thrilled to be your host this morning for this beautiful Advent Sunday. If you're joining us from A2TV, thank you for being with us. You definitely bless us every time you log on and join us in this way. You guys had some great video announcements, but we just want to point out a couple of things that we definitely want you to remember. Um, first of all, if you're a guest with us, we don't ask anything of you. We just want you to take that um, connection card that's right in front of the seat back in front of you. Fill that out. Let us know how you got here. Let us know how we can contact you and if you'd like more information about A2. We just want to know that you were here. If you are an owner, now's a good time to prepare his tithe and our offering to, to pick up later in the service. And you guys, this is, like I said, a special time for Advent. I don't know if you have enjoyed it as much as I have, but how many of you have been logging on to uh, Facebook Live? Have you enjoyed the Advent videos, the blogs? You guys, Advent means awaiting and just being expectant of his arrival. And we want to do that as a church family. And you get that opportunity by being a part of that those F Facebook Live events. So please don't miss out on that and try to make that a part of what you do. Another really special thing we do here is next Sunday, the No Limits Christmas. You guys, that is one of the best things that we do because we get to honor some families with love and support, and we get to be a part of that as a church family. Today is actually the last day to drop off your gifts and everything that you're sponsoring. If you do not have those with you and you have sponsored a child, if you're not prepared to drop those off by the second service today, please talk with the people out in the foyer so they can make arrangements to get, to, get those from you so we can be super prepared by next weekend. And if you haven't thought about volunteering yet, there's still plenty of ways that you can volunteer next week. You can volunteer by serving, cleaning up, helping to load presents into people's cars. You guys, there's all kinds of things you can do after the second service next week. So if you can 
make plans to be a part of that also see the desk outside. And with that said, I've been told it's also pretty important that if you are not accepting gifts personally next week, that we all park in front. Because that's going to be like the back parking lot next week is going to be our staging area. So if you're not receiving gifts, plan to park up front. You heard it in the video announcements earlier, but Christmas Eve is going to be a little different for us this year in that we're having the same service twice, but at two different times, one in the morning at 9 a.m. and then another at 4 p.m. So please be a part of that. It's just an amazing way just to be with your family and be with your A2 family as well. Well, we thank you so much for being a part of today. The band has another amazing song to get us ready for this amazing Advent day. So thank you for being here and enjoy the band. clap offering and praise. Just let that ring to God. Amen. Hey, you may be seated. Uh, 
Uh, if you've got your message notes, take them out of the program. And if you would like, if, if you brought your Bible this morning or your smart app, uh, you can open to a really, really important book in the Old Testament. And it's called the book of Isaiah. And we'll look at one of the most famous passages of Scripture. It gets quoted this time of year, each year. It's Isaiah chapter 9. This series, as Shannon, the team, they've already mentioned, it's called Advent. What are you expecting? The word Advent means arrival. It means coming. And an Advent, for a lot of churches, I didn't grow up in this kind of church. I didn't grow up in a church that observed a liturgical calendar. But in a lot of churches, for a few centuries, This time of year is a time of preparation that looks to two things. First of all, Jesus' first advent or arrival. When he came as a baby in a manger, he came to live the life we could never live, die the death we deserve to die, ultimately to rise again. That's the first advent, arrival. And advent, historically, has been this period that looks back on the Jewish people who for centuries, with a lot of expectation and anticipation, look forward to the arrival of Messiah. Because for centuries, they were really oppressed. For centuries, they they just existed under incredible bondage. A lot of it brought on by their own sin, their own rebellion. And there was this hope, this expectation that Messiah will come. And when Messiah comes, he'll make everything all right. Now, Advent not only looks back to that first Advent of Jesus, but it looks forward to this. Christians, historically Christians, and I know to modern ears this can sound weird, but we believe this. I'm staking my life on this. The fact that the same Jesus who came as a baby in a manger, that same Jesus is coming again. And the longer I live, the more I long for that. Uh, Paul, when he writes in Romans, he says that creation, creation has been subjected to frustration and futility until it's ultimately redeemed And as we wait, he says we're groaning with this kind of longing and expectation. We look around at all the brokenness in this world and say, oh God, please make it right. Now We're going to look at Isaiah 9, and I'm going to take the longest portion of this message to give you the intro. Because Isaiah chapter 9 was written originally to a group of people who were experiencing a crisis in leadership. The guy who was king at the time Isaiah 9 was written was a dude by the name of Ahaz. And by all accounts, this dude was bad to the bone. I mean, there's not one redeeming thing to say about Ahaz. And due to his very ineffective, failed leadership, Judah, the northern kingdom, it was in a crisis. There was a moral crisis. Morality had plummeted. There was a political crisis. Judah lived under the constant threat of invading armies that would bring incredible oppression. In fact, eventually that would occur. So there was military, political pressure or crisis. And when you have neighboring nations just standing on edge, ready to take over, that brings with it economic and financial uncertainty. The people were really living on the low end of the spectrum, economically, financially. And then there was a spiritual crisis. Uh, This is really interesting to me, and maybe, maybe an important word for parents this morning. Ahaz, the king at this time, he had a good dad. By all accounts, his dad was a guy by the name of Jotham. And Jotham had a heart for God, had a passion for God, had a longing to see 
God create a culture and a climate in Judah where the nation prospered under the leadership of God. Jotham, by all accounts, a really good dude. But parents, you need to know that even really, really good parents doesn't necessarily guarantee that your children will make really wise choices. Because Ahaz rejected the leadership of his dad. And he went his own way. When you're in leadership and you go your own way, here's the problem with it. Not only do you pay the price, the people you lead pay the price. Now, the Bible, the Bible is not a book about good people and bad people. If you read the Bible as a moral tale, you'll become a really religious person, but you could still be a really lost person. The Bible is a book about really bad people, period. And that includes you and it includes me. Really bad people and a really good God who for reasons only known to himself refuses to give up on us. And we set the stage last week. Our greatest problems don't come, and this is in your notes, they don't come from outside us. Our greatest problems come from inside us. And that means this at its core. The answer is not going to come from inside us. If there is an answer for our dilemma, It's going to have to come from outside us. And here's what the Bible says from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. It says this, Jesus, 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 Jesus is the answer. Now, that's a good place for somebody (laughs) besides Freddie to say amen. I just want you to think about the layout of the Bible, okay? And we do this a lot because I, I want to make certain. You know, my goal at A2 is, is not to create incredibly, really moral people. Now, I don't mean my goal is to create immoral people. I, I just mean the purpose of the Bible is, is not a moral tale. You can be moral and be lost. You can be moral and not know Jesus. You can be moral and self-righteous. Hey, let me drop a bomb on you. You can be moral and go to hell. Because the Bible is not a self-help book about how to become pristine in your morality. The Bible is about the fact that we are desperate for God. We need a savior, a savior who can save us from ourselves. And only by trusting in what he has done, can we attain a relationship with God, right? So throughout the Bible, the Bible, it doesn't do what moral books usually do, which they, they paint, they paint their subjects as being flawless. And maybe that's why in our culture, uh, we, we've revived the anti-hero, you know, the hero who is always incredibly flawed, but somehow saves the day. And in the Bible, this is the case. I mean, it starts out, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve hear the command of God. They blow it. They take fruit from a tree God forbade them not to eat from, and they're immediately separated from God. And you see just how far the fall goes when God walks into the garden and says, what's up, guys? What happened? And Adam wastes no time throwing his wife under the bus and saying, it was that woman you gave me. She is the reason I ate the fruit. And Eve is standing there, and God says, what's up? And Eve can't find anybody to blame, so she points to a snake and says, it's that snake you put in the garden. He spoke to me, and and I ate. God turns to the snake, and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. That's the story, right? (laughs) And immediately, this marriage becomes incredibly dysfunctional. And out of this dysfunctional marriage come a couple of dysfunctional kids. And Cain, the older, 
is so dysfunctional that because his brother has a more passionate, vibrant, intimate relationship with God than himself, Cain concocts this plan. I know how to solve the dilemma. I'll just kill my brother. And he kills Abel. And we read on just another chapter later about a guy by the name of Lamech. God created marriage between one man, one woman for life. It was to be beautiful. I mean, when the first marriage occurred, the man broke out in song. But by Genesis chapter 4, the Bible introduces us to a guy named Lamech. And the Bible says he married two women. He decided one wasn't enough. There's always greener pasture to be found. And he introduces polygamy and marriages have been stressed and fractured every, ever since. Bible introduces us to Noah. The Bible describes Noah like this, the most righteous man of his generation. That's pretty, pretty high remarks from God, right? And yet the same Noah that is declared the most righteous man of his generation, that same Noah gets drunk, gets naked, and when his boys discover him drunk and naked, he pronounces a curse on his own grandson. That's Noah. That's that Bible hero that you tell your children about. But it's amazing. We always leave out that part of the story. And children, here's Noah. When he gets drunk, he drank too much Bud Light, and he got naked. Don't be Noah. Leave that part out. Abraham lies about who his wife is not once, but twice, all to save his own skin. Abraham plays favorites between his sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Do you realize this? This is the guy that we revere. Abraham was the first deadbeat dad. When push comes to shove, Abraham puts Ishmael and Hagar out on the street, giving them very little sustenance. The first dad who didn't pay child support. Abraham takes a guy under his wing by the name of Lot. Lot gets really enamored with the culture of Sodom And the Bible calls Lot, listen to this, a righteous dude. But this is the same Lot. I mean, this breaks my heart as a dad. This is the same Lot that when angels visit him. And Lot understands these these messengers, they're different. He takes those messengers, those angels we know, into his home. And when the people of the city come to his door demanding that he send those men out so that they can sexually molest them, Lot closes the door, comes out and says, please don't molest these men who've come under my roof for protection. I'll give you my daughters. This is the brokenness of the people we read about in the Bible. Then Isaac, Isaac plays favorites between Jacob and Esau. Jacob deceives uh, Esau, deceives Isaac. Esau and Jacob become bitter enemies for the next 20 years. Jacob's wives, Jacob married two women. He worked seven years to get one, Rachel. They had the big wedding celebration. Got time to go into the tent, consummate the wedding. Evidently, it was really dark in that tent. Because the next morning, Jacob rolls over to kiss Rachel to say, Hey, sweetheart, I've been waiting for this moment. I've worked seven years for this morning. He rolls over and he's looking at Leah. And the Bible knows humor because the name Leah means cow eyes. In other words, he rolls over and thinks, my gosh. (laughs) So (laughs) this is in the Bible, people. This is the Bible. I'm asking you, do you tell your children stories like this? These are the stories as they actually are written. And boy, Jacob, he just goes off on his father-in-law Laban and says, hey, what's the deal with the wife swap, man? 
I was in this for Rachel and you gave me cow Ilea. <laughs> and uh, Laban says, hey, just fulfill your marital duties for a week. Isn't that obnoxious? That's in, that's in the text. And at the end of this week, tell you what, I'll give you her sister. You'll get this one on the payment plan. You'll get to go ahead and marry her, but you got to work another seven years to get her. Bible. Jacob doesn't learn from his own parents' mistakes. He has children. He favors one child, Joseph, over 11 others. It creates such incredible sibling rivalry that the others decide to kill Joseph. These are the stories in the Bible. Guys, these people in the Bible aren't Chip and Joanna Gaines. They aren't Jack and Rebecca Pearson. For all of you, this is us fans. They're not Ben and Leslie Nope, Jim and Pam Halpert. They're not the Waltons, the Brady Bunch, or certainly not Leave It to Beaver. The people in the Bible need Dr. Field, Dr. Drew, Dr. Laura, Dr. Ruth, Dr. Spock, and Dr. Seuss. They need anybody. Somebody please help these people. This is, I just want to ask you, does this make you more hopeful about your own family, families when you hear about these? I'm, I'm so hopeful. I'm thinking, thank God, I thought we were screwed up, but at least we're not as screwed up as these people. Thank you, God. But we are. I am and you are, and we don't like to admit it. And then we stand back in judgment over every revelation that takes place in our culture. A Hollywood movie mogul. comes out that for years he has been guilty of sexual assault and sexual harassment and sexual misconduct. He ends up being fired from his own company for this kind of activity. A trusted morning news anchor is accused of some of the same things and fired from his position as a trusted news person. Politicians regularly resign due to similar allegations of misconduct. Families almost every day and every week fracture over similar conduct. This is the society we live in. It's been broken. It's been broken since Genesis 3. It is still broken. It was a really smart dude. He he has died the last couple of years. His name, Dallas Willard. And if you get a chance to read anything Dallas Willard has written, read it. Uh, He was professor of philosophy at University of Southern California, and he's written tons of books on spiritual formation. He was a devoted Christian. I mean, he's one of these dudes who walk so close to Jesus that you're like, oh, wow, that's possible. And and somebody once asked Dallas Willard, they were talking about this, this kind of doctrine that I'm bringing up today. They asked him whether or not he believed in total depravity. Total depravity. He answered, he said, I believe in sufficient depravity. And they looked back because they were theologically astute. And they said, "Uh, I mean, you'll have to help me out. I've never heard that doctrine. I've never heard that term, sufficient depravity. And Willard explained, I believe that every human being is sufficiently depraved, so sufficiently depraved that nobody will ever get into heaven and turn around and say, I deserve to be here. Now, that's the Bible. And right now, it's not feeling like very good news, right? (laughs) Thank you, Chris. I came to church to discover just how broken and messed up and seriously wrecked we are. I'd managed to forget about it, and you brought it brilliantly to my mind. Here's what I believe. You can't really know the solution until you know the depth of the problem. Uh, in the Bible, there's this term, and it gets mentioned in Isaiah 9, 6, and I told you we were going there. It's the term peace, and when we hear the word peace, we often think of peace as referring to the absence of conflict, the absence of war, the absence of problems, the absence of stress, 
But in the Bible, the word peace doesn't mean that. In the Bible, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. In the Greek, it's irene. And, and I think I gave it to the guys. I may not have, and if so, I'll tell you what it is. But here's what shalom, irene, what they mean. It means, it means the way God wants things to be. The way things ought to be. That's what a great scholar by the name of Cornelius Plantinga said. Uh, another writer says, Shalom is a condition in which all things follow their destiny undisturbed. In, every, in other words, everything is just moving in the right direction. Another person said it means shalom means to restore, make complete, make whole. See, here's the point. Here's what I've been trying to illustrate. This world isn't the way it ought to be. This world is a wreck. We are a wreck. Whether it's domestic violence, corrupt politicians, corrupt Hollywood executives, reckless, arrogant world leaders, terrorism, ISIS, Ebola, the million different ways we sin, on a daily basis, this world isn't the way it's supposed to be. That's why Plantiga, this philosopher, he calls sin the vandalism of shalom. But he says shalom carries the idea that one day God's going to set the whole mess right. Let me just give you the bullets. Sin isn't the final word in our story. The brokenness that I've just taken 15 minutes to describe, it's not the final word in our story. Here's the first word in our story. You were made, I was made, we were made in the image of God. And for reasons only known to God, God loves us recklessly and relentlessly. He has never stopped loving us. That's the first word in the story. You are a person deeply loved by God. Here's the second word, sin. We took the perfect shalom God gave us when he created this world and we vandalize it. We wrote graffiti all over it. But the next word in the story is this, redemption. God took the mess we had made. He placed our sin, guilt, shame, insecurity, inadequacy on Jesus. That's why we've got crosses in the front two corners of the room and right here in the center of the room. And on the cross, Jesus bore our sin, died in our place through his death. He made peace between us and God. And because of Jesus, we can stand before God today, redeemed, restored, rescued, renewed, reconciled. Furthermore, three days after Jesus' death on the cross, God put the stamp of his approval on everything that Jesus had done. By this fact, Jesus didn't stay in the grave. Jesus rose victoriously over the grave saying, declaring that the victory I've achieved is also possible for you. That's the good news of the gospel. Now, I love the way Plantinga writes about this, and I don't know if I, if I gave you guys the quote or not, David. Did I? Yeah, I did. Good. Here's what Cornelius Plantinga, he, he's this scholar that writes a lot about shalom and, and sin. He says, to speak of sin by itself. To speak of it apart from the realities of creation and grace is to forget the resolve of God. Oh, listen, God wants shalom and will pay any price to get it back. Hmm. Human sin is stubborn, but not as stubborn as the grace of God and not half so persistent. That's the good news of the gospel. Let me give it to you the way Paul wrote it in Romans. Romans, I think it's chapter five, if you'll bring it up. Here's what Paul says in the message. Sin didn't and sin doesn't. Have, have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins Grace wins hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death, and that's the end of it. 
Grace, because God is putting everything together. That's shalom. Grace, because God is putting everything together again to the Messiah, invites us into life, a life that goes on and on and on, world without end. Ladies and gentlemen, in a brief capsule, that is the gospel of Jesus. You can give him a hand. So, so, let me, you, 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 say, you asked me to turn to Isaiah. You've not read Isaiah. Would you please read Isaiah, Chris? L- let's read it. And let me give you four thoughts as James comes because we're going to respond in worship. Here's what I'm going to do. David, I only gave you verse 6. I'm going to read the first five verses, but I'm going to read them fast. So if you'll hold verse 6 until I get to for unto us a child is born. Let me, let me read. Because remember, this was written to a group of people who were in darkness. Kind of like the dark in, darkness I've described. The brokenness I've described. But here's what God says. And I want you to listen, listen, listen to the tense of the grammar. Because it often uses past tense. God's speaking into a very broken situation. But he speaks as if he's already brought deliverance. Why? Why? Because any time God gives a word, it's as sure as done. Listen to what God says to people who who were surrounded by the same kind of brokenness we're surrounded by. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, it will be filled with glory. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned and God will make it happen. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of all those invading troops along with their shirts soaked with innocent blood will be piled up in a heap and burned in a fire for days. God says, I'm going to take all this brokenness and I'm going to redeem it. Why? Here's the payoff verse, verse number six. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be up on his shoulders. Our greatest problems don't come from outside us. They come from inside us. That means our solution can't come from inside us. It's got to come from outside us. And the solution is right here. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. The government will be up on his shoulders. And let's read the last part together. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I love the way the message reads. Prince of Wholeness. He's setting it right. He's restoring it. You can leave that up for just a moment. You ready to fill in those blanks? Those of you who were wondering if I was going to get to it, I am. Here they are really quickly. And by the way, we could have a sermon for each of these. We will not. But I'll give you the blanks. Here's how Jesus meets our greatest needs. He gives supernatural intervention and guidance when you need it most because he is wonderful counselor. I love the word wonderful there in the Hebrew. It's the Hebrew word pele, and it means marvelous, miraculous. It means this, our God is a miracle working God. So I put two bullets for you in your notes. Jesus still does miracles. He's wonderful. And he gives guidance. He is counselor. Here's how Jesus meets our greatest need. Two, not only does he give supernatural intervention and guidance, he gives divine power to overcome and keep fighting when your strength fails. He is mighty God. And I love the phrase mighty God. It actually means hero God or warrior God. It means this, the God who fights our battles for us. That's our God. Three, how does Jesus meet our greatest needs? 
He gives grace and compassion when you need a perfect Father's love. He's everlasting Father. I love that phrase, everlasting Father. In the Hebrew, you could translate it like this. He is the Father until dot, dot, dot. Until what? Until whatever. Fill in the blank. He's going to be the father who is standing there ready to welcome you back home. Put a robe on your shoulders, a ring on your finger, shoes on your feet, and say, my son, my daughter was lost, but now they've returned. He is everlasting father. Four, four. How does he meet our greatest need? He gives peace and wholeness when you feel like everything is falling apart. He is Prince of Peace. He is the one, the only one who can restore shalom. Wholeness. You feel it, don't you? Every once in a while, that tweak between who you are and who you were created to be. Jesus is the only one who restores wholeness. So if you want to lean into him, I want to lead you in a prayer. Now, This prayer isn't some kind of incantation. It's just a means, a method for you to express faith. But if you're desperate for Jesus to to take your brokenness and make you whole, say this prayer. You ready? Close your eyes. We're going to say this prayer out loud, but not alone. Faith family at A2, say it with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus who lived the life I could never live, died the death I deserve to die, rose again for my victory. Thank you that he and only he can restore peace, shalom, to this broken world and my broken life. I trust him. Amen. Eyes closed. If you're here and you'll say, Chris, I just prayed that prayer. I made a commitment to Jesus for the first time or I recommitted my life to him. Nobody's looking around but me. But right now, I want you to lift your hand if you made that decision to follow Jesus or to trust him. Lift it up. Yes, I see that one. Somebody else? Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Somebody else? Make that decision. Yay, Jesus. You can put down your hand. Everybody look this way. I think I saw one, maybe two people raise their hand. And the Bible says this. Heaven rejoices when one person repents. Let's give God a loud praise offering. Yes, Jesus. So everybody, take out those connection cards right now. Take them out. Shannon talked about them. The video announcement talked about them. If you made that decision to trust Jesus, there's a place on the back to put, I committed my life to Christ. I recommitted my life to Christ. Mark that now. If you call this place home, this is a great place to plan to prepare to honor God with his tithe and our offering. Take that out. Ushers, I want you to prepare. In just a minute, Freddie is going to sing about the peace of God. As he sings, we're going to light the second candle in the Advent wreath, the peace candle. And I want you to take a break. In fact, I'm going to ask the ushers. Ushers, are you here? Come on down now, if you would. Come on down. The moment you hit the front, begin to pass those containers. And now drop in those connection cards. Honor God with his tithe and offering. But I want to create a moment of just quietness in this room because some of us need a break. My week has been massive. It's been like one of the biggest work weeks in a long time. And today I needed to be reminded of the shalom of God, that God is the only one who can take my fractured brokenness and produce in me wholeness. So we're just going to take a moment to sit in his presence. During the song that Freddie sings, if you need to stand, you can stand to worship. If you want to kneel, you can kneel. Or if you just want to sit, sit. And then the band will lead us from that into another hymn. And I'll come back and instruct us on Holy Communion. But right now, 
right now. Let's just invite the shalom of God to cover us. So oh. 